Will you pray with me? Good and gracious God, we pray for your church universal, that we may be a beacon of hope and grace and love and light in this world. May our open doors reflect your open arms to all. May our arms and hands reaching out to those in need reflect your love for all. May our forgiveness of one another reflect your forgiveness for all. Continue, we ask, to pour out your Holy Spirit into reforming your church for all people. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Creator, Jesus, our Savior, and our friend, and from the Holy Spirit who guides and consoles. Amen. The story of Reformation Sunday is a story of change. It is a story of adaptation. It is a story of renewal. Through the lens of 500 plus years of history, we tend to think Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg on October 31st of 1517 as a pivotal point in Western civilization. Brother Martin, who was an Augustinian monk at that moment, had two significant disagreements with the established Roman Catholic Church, and he wanted to start a conversation with Pope Leo X. First, Brother Martin had come to believe that the Bible, and not the Roman hierarchy or the Pope, was the true and final religious authority. And second, Martin diverged with Roman orthodoxy that taught salvation was possible through good works or works of righteousness, behaviors that pleased God, somehow that we could earn our right to the M&Ms or to our place in heaven. Luther came to understand that there was nothing a person could do to fully justify themselves in the eyes of God. Our good deeds would never be enough to save us. There was always more that we could do, and we were sinners to begin with. Our good deeds will never be enough. But God gives us salvation and limitless grace in that granted to us in spite of the fact that we could never earn it. St. Paul's letter to the Romans that Steve read this morning couldn't be clearer. St. Paul writes, Since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For we hold that a person is justified, that is, made right, by faith apart from works prescribed by law. How liberating. From our perspective today, Luther's action on that All Hallows' Eve might seem groundbreaking, almost cataclysmic in its theological impact. It was the right time to make this statement about papal authority, and it was the right time to amend how we thought about how God's grace is the source of our salvation, the sole source of our salvation. And most certainly, Luther, his predecessors, and his successors all made the life death and resurrection of Jesus a reality to so many of us, both in the 16th century and in the years since then, up to today. That is a reality for us because these women and men made their statements. And without these courageous people, perhaps the word of God would never have reached the hearts of so many. But I do not think that the nailing of the 95 Theses was a pivotal point or seen as a pivotal point on the day that it happened. 
The foundation for Luther's argument for change was decades in the making. And the nailing of the 95 theses to the church door bubbled up almost organically out of what had happened in the previous couple of decades. It was kind of the last step of a long process of changing thought and concern for the people and their true place in the religious life and in the church of Christ Jesus. Prior to Luther, there were objections to the church being the sole religious authority in Western civilization. There was disagreement about the ways money was collected from peasants to support the church's perceived and real opulence. Dissent was not uncommon in those decades leading up to Martin Luther's changing, change act, but it was silenced. Dissenters condemned, excommunicated, their writings were burned. It was not unusual for reformers or people who protested to be excommunicated. It was not unusual for them to be imprisoned. And unfortunately, many of them became martyrs. Luther's action was mainly was merely one more event in history that made the statement that reform, growth, and change within the church is inevitable. More importantly, reform, growth, and change within the church was necessary, and it is healthy. And just as it was healthy then, in 1517, it's healthy now. The Reformation was not a singular event, but if we're paying close attention to our lives, we will recognize the change now within our lives today. Our response to change is being alive and being alert and being open to making things better. Now, I often hear change is frightening and scary and that we are resistant to change. And sometimes, change is very painful. John and I can attest to that in very dramatic ways. And I'm sure that you've all felt the stress of change. And I confess to you, my siblings in Christ, that often my immediate go-to reaction to overwhelming, scary change is to hide under the covers, pulling them fully over my head, not peeking out, not even for a second, because I'm really sure that that ugly change monster is out there, and I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with that change, and I'd just soon stay in bed. In this sanctuary, a few weeks ago, the Reconciling in Christ team held a conversation with those who were interested in why we use pronouns in our congregational life. You heard it earlier. I was introduced to Pastor Christine Kaur, whose pronouns are she and her. This was a sacred time of sharing, and we were blessed by the comments and the willingness to express thoughts and feelings and judgments of so many people. Not unsurprisingly, we don't all agree on this issue, and that is perfectly acceptable. We don't always have to agree on everything because, oh my goodness, how boring would that be? And none of us in this priesthood of all believers has any special authority over any of us, others of us. So this is one of those places where no one is demanding anyone change their hearts, their minds, their beliefs so dearly held. We all have autonomy and we have a right to our own thinking and no one, that is no one, will ever have to worry about being imprisoned for voicing their sincere beliefs, even if you disagree with me. I've learned in my too many decades to count 
life. When these points of disagreement occur within any group, especially within this church body, it is never appropriate for me to respond by getting my back up and becoming all caught up in my own self-righteousness. And I'm good at self-righteousness. I hope I always remember that disagreements are invitations into more authentic relationships with you, the beloved community of God. God yearns for us all to be free to love and to grow, to be human, and to enter into each other's lives with respect and care and tenderness. And I try to remember that disagreements are always invitations to be curious. For when I am curious, I'm almost always learning something I did not know. And learning about the stories of each one of God's precious people enriches me beyond measure. So if you had an opportunity to be part of that conversation a couple of weeks ago, thank you. I felt honored. The Reconciling in Christ team felt honored, and I hope you too felt honored to be able to talk about this in loving relationship with one another. But that conversation also sent me down a little bit of a rabbit hole of wonderment. Now, you probably all know this, but I've always wanted to be a really nerdy theologian. So I felt free, and perhaps you do too, and I can invite you along to feel free in my nerdy theologian head, to ponder how the history of Western Christendom might have been what might have been different if Pope Leo had gotten curious about Brother Martin's concerns? What if Pope Leo had become intrigued and asked questions and decided to enter into sincere relationship with Martin Luther? What would it be like today if rather than respond as he did, with hackles up and his theological sword completely unsheathed, the Pope entered into conversation and relationship. What happened, would happen if Pope Leo had gotten curious? How would history have unfolded then? Now, I need not remind you, good people of West Lynn Lutheran Church, that you are in the middle of a bit of change. You are in the middle of a transition process that will bring you a new pastor. The Holy Spirit is hard at work within this place, and that new person will be identified and called. I am sure of it. We've had some staff changes. And today, we, w we wish our AV coordinator, Josh Dohler, Godspeed and farewell as he moved on, moves on to his next best thing. And as Pastor Scott so eloquently laid out for us last week, there are tough financial realities facing us today and tomorrow. While encouraging us in our faithful response to expand ministry, and mission beyond this building to as many people as we can. And I can remind you that financial support of this community is a pillar not only for Pastor Scott and Susie, but for John and me. Great things flourish in God's garden with our faithful witness. Now those changes that I just described may not be worthy of sparking another reformation, Or they may not be challenges in the way Luther saw a challenge. But I also wonder, and I ask you to wonder along with me, what happens if we start to think that perhaps change isn't scary or dangerous after all, but an incredible range of 
awesome opportunity set in front of us. After all, God changes caterpillars into butterflies, sand into pearls, and coal into precious diamonds through the forces of time and pressure. So what makes us think that God is not working on us just like that, with time and pressure, nudging, and a little bit of force right now? Is that how God is working in this community? We are a resurrection people, and I think that we know that embracing change in the depths of our souls, right here in the heart, where we really feel the emotion of being alive, is what we are all about. Jesus has told us in this morning's reading, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Why don't we take Jesus at his word and start to truly embody the fact that Christ has set us free to the, be the change we want to see in this world? Christ has set us free to be bold in our actions and take risks to try and fail and try again. Think of adapting to a change as a sign of strength and resilience. Change moves us forward into a future we might imagine to be bright and glorious. One of my colleagues in the Oregon Synod reminds me that the change and challenges that come with it will always be a part of us, always but that life and resurrection will always get the next breath. I wonder if you believe that too. The Holy Spirit, I assure you, will continue to send us all opportunities for change for the better, for change for glorious existence in this beautiful world. I challenge you to embrace those changes when you see them in front of you. Amen.